This is Beyond with Heather Tesh, where we examine near-death experiences and life itself, hopefully making this life a little better. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. We are now heading into part two with Sean. I will have a link to part one in the description, and that takes us through his near-death experience. But hold on, because he is about to share a really fascinating experience he had. Plus, we're going to talk a little bit more about that near-death experience. So here we go into part two. It sounds fascinating. Another place that I found really fascinating was the library, because that is something that I've heard from other people. And I'm trying to visualize it. And I imagine this kind of old wood you know, um, walls and, and just kind of antique-ish. Is that what it is or how would you describe it? I know you said it's huge. Yeah, it's huge. And yeah, that's pretty close to how I remember it. So if I picture it right now, and it's, it's, it's the other weird thing is like this NDE, I, I can picture 100% every time. Um, it's like I'm back there every time. It's never faded. Um, it's always crystal clear. And yeah, the, there's this giant hallway so it's got to be i don't know 200 300 400 feet tall and it's got this wood paneling everywhere and it's really ornately uh decorated with like wood carvings of i don't even know um there's like a there's like paintings along the top of the hall and the there's levels so there's like a floor 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 and there's all these bookshelves that line line the walls and in between there's like these wood pillars and this wood floor and it smells um old like with leather and wood like it was kind of like heaven for me because i love that smell like that's like it was super super nice and there was these torches that didn't give off smoke that lit the place and then there were chandeliers hanging and uh there were stained glass windows at the end that were kind of letting in light. Uh, but it was, it was like dark and moody and uh, it wasn't scary or anything. It was just like, it was, it was like cozy, even though it was like immense. That's what I got. Yeah. It was the feeling of coziness, even though it was huge. Did you get a sense of what was in the books that you saw? Mm, not at the time. Um, but later on, I'd been uh, given a, a tour of the, well, maybe I can tell you that story then quickly. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so in August of 2023, I had this feeling like I needed to do something. I was kind of, I find, I kind of come to a crossroads and in my life of after of dealing with a lot of internal, uh, internal battles. And I ended up, uh, deciding that I needed a hypnotic regression. Um, I wasn't quite sure why I've had uh, experiences with non-human intelligence as, as well. And, uh, but I didn't feel like, um, that was it, but I needed something. And so I got, uh, I talked to, uh, Robin Lassiter, who's part of the experiencer group. Um, she's written a really great book called earth, a love story, and she does hypnotic regressions. She suggested that we do uh, a hypnotic journey uh, where I can meet some, uh, meet someone that can maybe give me some guidance because. I didn't know quite sure what I was supposed to do. And uh, so we did it over Zoom. Um, she, I laid down on my bed. She watched me from the computer and she started uh, putting me in hypnosis and I can fall into hypnosis really fast. Uh, and I ended up in this black void again. So I have these, I have these kind of patterns, I think. And uh, so I was in this black void and I was telling Robin that I can't see anything. And she said, well, just uh, stop trying to think of things. Just like let your mind fill in the blanks. And all of a sudden then I was sitting and there was sand starting to fill around me and then spread out. And then I saw a palm tree grow. And then I saw the pyramids and I've never been to Egypt, but it's like always been a place um, I've had a connection to. And uh, I was sitting there and it was hot. I could feel the sun. And... Uh, Robin asked if there was any, um, anybody with me. And I said, yeah, I feel somebody. And I looked, and I looked over and I could see a 
uh, a knee right beside me. And it was like a brown, his skin was brown, dark brown, and um, very muscled. And then he had like this white, like tunic. Then I saw that his head was a bird head. I decided to talk to him, uh, or I thought I should. And he, I couldn't understand him. His mouth was moving, but I couldn't understand him. And uh, Robin suggested to ask him to see if he can uh, adjust me. And so, uh, or help me. Um, understand him. And so he put, put his finger to my temple. I think that's what he did. Yeah. Uh, put his finger to my temple and he, he started adjusting something, but it hurt like crazy. Like it felt like, uh, like I was getting electrocuted and it hurt way too much. And I, and I said, no, he, stop, stop, stop. It hurts too much. And he went, he went, okay. And, um, uh, I asked him what his name was. And for some reason I could understand that. And he said, raw, he leads me over. He, reaches out his hand and he, I grab his hand and he, he, and he's super tall, like way taller than me. He was probably like seven feet tall. So I grab his, his hands and we start floating up, uh, into, uh, the, the sky until we get bigger and bigger and bigger until the galaxies are tiny. Um, and they're all, all around us. There's all these galaxies and he takes a, and we're floating there and he takes this galaxy and he, he compresses it into this white ball and he holds it there. And he gives it to me and I ask him, what's this for? And at this point I didn't realize, but I had started understanding him. I could understand him all of a sudden. Uh, it didn't occur to me until after. And he said, uh, he's like, um, he's like, you'll understand, uh, later. And he gives it to me and he p helps me push it into my chest. Um, later on, uh, months later, um, I had been doing med doing meditations pretty consistently. And one of the meditations we got taught to do is visualize your energy. And what happened spontaneously during the meditation is that ball came out of my chest. And that's how I visualize my, my energy, uh, my, my own energetic signature, uh, if it were. And so it's this white ball. And at the time, uh, when I first started working with it, it was like cloudy and there's like, it was all clouds in there and dark streaks going through things. And then there was like black things on top of it that like look almost look like leeches that I would have to pluck off. And now when I, when I work with it, it's just like, a, it looks like a pearl. So it's, it's, it's like a solid piece of energy. And, uh, so, so we, uh, we start flowing back down. So I've got this ball inside me and we start floating down and he grabs my hand and we start walking around the, um, the dunes and we start walking down and towards the pyramids and it went from the sun high up in the sky to where now it's like dusk and purple. Uh, we start walking towards this pyramid and there's this giant entrance with pillars on, uh, on each side and we go in and the inside's way bigger than the outside. Like the, the pyramid's huge, but like inside seems like it's immense. And, uh, it can't see any of the edges. It's all like in shadows. And he brings me in and we stop in the middle and we sit down cross-legged and he tells me to, uh, copy him. And so he gives me this positioning where I have to keep my spine straight. I have to sit cross-legged and I have to do this with my hands, uh, which I learned later is called a mudra. So there's all these different things that you can do with your, your hands in order to, um, activate certain chakras or certain, uh, energies within your body system. And so, uh, this one is for your throat chakra, um, which is for uh, being able to speak. Um, and I didn't think at the time I had trouble speaking, but I think now that's actually helped me a lot. And, uh, so I do this and then we do, he was doing this hyperventilating. So going, <laughs> and then breathe out really fast, breathe in really fast. And it was making me dizzy. And he said, Oh, that's good. That's good. Keep going. And so I was getting really dizzy. I was starting to spin, spin. And then I, uh, my astral body left my, my body, even though I was in my mind, I guess. Um, and I out, had an out of body experience and then he said, perfect. And then I went back down and he, he gets up and, uh, he says, uh, he's proud of me. And I just started bawling, like 
it was probably one of the most um, cathartic moments of my life. I would say the NDE and this one are probably one of the top top two moments of my life uh, for impact on my life. Um, and I was crying inside his arms and I was like this child. Um, so I've kind of felt like an inner child healing, I think. Um, and we stood there for a couple minutes, just, uh, I was just letting everything out, uh, knowing that, um, I was still on the path. Cause I thought I, I, I wasn't doing very well at the time. I thought I felt like I needed to do a lot more than I was like, I could only heal so fast. I could only explore things so fast. Um, and I felt like I wasn't doing it fast enough. And what uh, the sense I got for him is no, it's, this is all perfect timing. Stop worrying so much. Stop being so hard on yourself. And so it's this constant messaging of stopping, have some more compassion for, for yourself. Um, so then after that, we, uh, he gra grabbed me by the hand again, and we walked into this other part of this te temple or whatever this was. And there was this golden tree trunk, uh, this giant golden tree trunk that was went up and into this pyramid. And there was all these books that lined the walls, uh, very similar to uh, the one I was in my NDE. We went to this one shelf um, and he brought me over and he pulled out this giant book and he opened it and he, and there was, there was mid, it stopped mid sentence. And he said, this is your book. He's like, and you're still writing it. And he said, uh, and he, and I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and he closed it and he put it back. And then we started sliding down and we kept sliding down, down, down into this darkness, uh, this blackness, uh, cause all the, everything starts slowly disappearing and we kept sliding down until we came to a door and I opened the, uh, he opened the door and we walk in and it's my white room. And I had created this room, uh, a year before, uh, and during a meditation, I put a shelf there and I put books there and I put a. Uh, two chairs, kind of like the ones that Morpheus sits in, like the leather chairs on a carpet and stuff. And then I'd also put in my um, uh, vision board, but like of 3D objects. So I put my vision board of like a Corvette and uh, winning the lottery and like all these different things, uh, like all those materialistic things. I hadn't involved that much and uh, <laughs> I'm still a human. And Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I would just use it. To, I'd go in there and like do my meditation and stuff. And then until one point, uh, it, about a month later, I had gone in and somebody was waiting for me inside there and the door slammed shut and I got booted out of my own meditation and I was never able to go back in there. Um, so it was like, it had been like a year since I'd been in there. And so when Rob brought me down, I was like, well, that's interesting. And, uh, he walked in first and he, uh, he went over to my vision board and wiped away the Corvettes and wiped away all the materialistic things. And he let me keep some of the things like, like, uh, places I've wanted to travel, like Stonehenge and stuff, which I've now gone to, um, uh, Egypt and, uh, greenhouses. Cause I love, uh, I want to build a greenhouse at my parents, my, uh, parents land and stuff. So he let me keep that stuff, uh, but any materialist things, he's just like, no, you don't get that. And then uh, he put in this table and uh, it's like one of those old writing desks. So it's like that slanted one where you put like the, and it had like a inkwell with a, with a quill pen. And then uh, there is this pillow with an outline of my, myself. And he went down, he w went and sat in the leather chair and lit a cigar. And he just kind of crossed his legs and he was just sitting there smoking a cigar while I was, he told me to go like look around the and see what changes he's made. And, uh, he was a funny guy. Uh, he was really funny. And so he, uh, so he, uh, so I'm looking around and my book that he showed me appears on this desk and it's, it's like halfway, it's like halfway through the book and it's half mid with midway through the, the sentence, we stand up and he starts, we start zooming out and we keep, um, zooming out until he sees that, um, there's, I can see earth and there's all these little white rooms all over dotted all over the, the earth, like everywhere. There's tons of these white rooms and that, uh, this is like safe places within yourself. Um, and half, most of them are empty. There's some that are, have people in them. Um, 
and uh, we zoom back down and he says, uh, he says, okay. And he leaves and I'm sta- standing there kind of going, Hmm, I wonder what's what I'm supposed to do. And to the left, right beside the door is this view. It's like a view screen um, or like a port or a glass window. And it's like rectangular with rounded edges. And uh, you can see like there's um, like it's in the bottom of the ocean. And then right beside that, the door, a list appears and it's one, uh, it's listed one to a hundred. So number one was uh, don't worry about my body image so much, eat healthy, uh, do meditation. Number four was blank. And number five was do yoga. And I was thinking, and I was like, oh, number four. I was like, well, there's, there's gotta be something there. And, uh, I was thinking about, thinking about, I was like, oh, I need to have an out of body experience. I have to do that, be able to do that. And then that one filled in. Um, and then I was just kind of like wandering there, like kind of wandering around looking. And all of a sudden I started, uh, zooming out again and I zoomed out, zoomed out until I could see the earth. Like the earth was this big and then it got smaller and smaller and smaller. Then it was the galaxies and the galaxies got smaller and smaller and smaller. And then, uh, I was in this white room. Uh, but this one was huge. It was, uh, kind of like in Star Trek, uh, where Picard goes to the, like the afterlife. It's kind of like that. And it was huge. Like you couldn't see, you couldn't see anything. It was just like this immense void of whiteness. And Robin said, uh, there's a door to your, um, go find the door. And so the, a doorway appeared and I was able to go back through it and I ended up back in my room and then rock swam by. Uh, he was swimming outside and he gave me the double thumbs up. And then, um, I thought, uh, it felt like I was, I was done. And so I came out of the meditation. Yeah. So the next, this last couple months and stuff has been about, uh, trying to do these, all these different things. And only recently have I actually, I skipped number one and two essentially. And I was just trying to do meditation every day and trying to do, uh, uh, out of body experiences with the gateway tapes and I was trying to do yoga and I had skipped totally how to take care of myself with number one and number two, which was stop worrying about my body image so much and have compassion for myself and eat healthy. So, um, I ended up joining Diana Pasolka's protocols class and a lot of hers is the exact same. So now, now I'm, I've stepped back from all that other stuff and I'm just trying to build a foundation, um, that, uh, I can build from because my foundation was cracking and creaking and I wasn't just, I wasn't taking care of myself. So now I'm trying to do like water. I'm like focusing on water right now. So I'm trying to drink three liters of water a day. And then the, and I'm also uh, changing my eating habits and my, it turns out I'm an emotional eater. So yeah, there's been a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. So I'm focusing on the the basics now and then I'm going to start building up, up after that. Well, I think your story is a good sales pitch for why we should meditate. <laughs> yeah. Because it really shows you the depths or the heights that you can reach. Yeah. And uh, I think people need to be more patient with themselves because, like, you always hear about people like, oh, you have to meditate like every day. You have to um, do two hours a day. It's like, well, I got kids. Um, right. I have them one week at, uh, one week at a time because I'm I'm uh, separated and divorced. But uh, when I'm with them, uh, I barely have time to breathe. Um, <laughs> like it's really hard to be able to do. So you have to have you have to be able to fit into your life. So sometimes, like even just five minutes, being able to calm yourself and be able to give yourself that little bit of time just to have that breath in, um, that's sometimes just enough. And then other times uh, during your life, when you have more time, you can, you can maybe increase it. It's like this flow. Mm-hmm. There's sometimes that you're sometimes that you can do lots and there's sometimes that it's just enough that you're freaking here. Um, and that's what I think a lot of people, we, we need to be more compassionate with each other and ourselves. One thing that I think is a real blessing is that not only, you know, can you reach some of these experiences during meditation, but you said you can kind of just close your eyes and you can feel what you felt during your near death experience, which really is such a gift, especially if you're having a hard day, if you can just sort of return to that. Yeah. Yeah. I never really thought about that, but yeah, yeah. I kind of, especially now that I've been talking about it. Um, 
because there was a point where I didn't want to talk about anything. And now I'm starting to do, I'm starting to talk about everything. And uh, yeah, being able to revisit those times, uh, especially with um, the feeling of compassion and love from outside yourself um, with no judgment. I think that's the key is that there's zero judgment. Um, and we, cause we, uh, but we always judge ourselves the harshest. And I feel like, uh, yeah, it's really nice to be able just to just picture it and just feel that again to recenter myself. I also found it interesting going back to your near-death experience that you were talking about this presence or you were saying they, but you couldn't really see this presence that was with you when you went into the room and there was the dome that we talked about in part one. And it reminded me of another guest I talked to, Brie Lafferty. And she said too, you know, she knew that there was this presence here. She felt it even though she didn't actually see it. And I, I do find that a lot with near-death experiences is that there's um, that feeling is so important. Yeah, the feeling is the, <clears throat> I don't know, for me, it's feel, the, yeah, it feels. And if, especially for a guy that uh, didn't, uh, wasn't able to face any of his feelings for, the, for most of my life, because um, I was like 34 when it happened. And yeah, 34 when it happened, uh, for so like for 34 years, I was trying to avoid any type of feeling other than like pain and pleasure. That was it. And I was really trying to avoid pain <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, feelings. Uh, now I feel everything like I'm a hypersensitive baby almost sometimes. And, uh, but that's okay. Um, because when you, I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest points is that, uh, there's a saying that you have to feel it to heal it and that, um, you can't avoid, you can't avoid, uh, the hard things and, uh, everything just, there was a feeling on the, on that, wherever this was that you could just literally feel everything. And it was not overwhelming. Um, I don't know about you, but, uh, since my NDE, I've had, I, I can feel people way more. I can under, it's like, if I make eye contact with a person, um, I can understand a person almost instantly now. And sometimes it gets super overwhelming because there's things I just don't, I don't want to feel like from other people. And it took me the longest time, it probably took me three years to figure out that it wasn't me that all the time. Um, I had a coworker that would be super angry sometimes. And then all of a sudden I wouldn't even be near him. But since we had worked together so long, um, all of a sudden I'd be doing my thing in the crane and then all of a sudden I become like super angry and I couldn't understand it. I didn't understand anything. I couldn't figure it out. And then it turned out, oh, it wasn't me. It's just, I'm, I, because we're all connected, there's a, um, Carl Jung talks about the collective unconscious and that uh, we're all connected on a, on a layer. Like uh, if, uh, we're, if we're like, um, we're on the surface of this, of this ocean, we're all connected, uh, uh, like if we're all different waves or ripples, we're all connected underneath and that this collective unconscious, uh, we feel everything. We just have, sh it's all been shut down somehow. And, uh, I think that's where we're going now is that we're slowly starting to connect on a deeper level with everybody. And I find that really interesting because I'm that way too, where I can pick up on feelings. And I always will joke with my husband that, you know, he can be coming down the stairs and all I see are his feet. And I know exactly his mood. Is it good? Is it bad? Mm -hmm. Whatever. And I especially find I pick up on people, um, whether their their emotion is anger or sadness, I tend to get it as sadness. Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, why am I feeling that way? Mm -hmm. And, you know, then I realize it's somebody that is around me or has been around me. And I've picked up on it and it's, it's hard, isn't it? Oh, it's super hard. And, and once you realize that, uh, most anger is because they're, they're, uh, it's either from a sadness or a fear response. Um, you're picking, we're like, we're picking up on the basic stuff, like, like they're the roots of everything. Um, and it's really hard to separate the outer from the, their inner core because you can just feel how sad they are and you could, or you're or how scared they are or, all those different things. Um, yeah, it's super interesting. And the more, 
the more shadow work you do, the, the more things seem to open up. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's hard sometimes. Um, I, I count it as a blessing now at so, a couple of years ago, I thought it was a damn curse because it was just overwhelming to the point where it's just way too much. Like it was way too much to figure out who was, who was who and, um, figuring out, like, I could feel like they would say something, but I could feel the undertones of what they were actually, it was like, you got like, like almost like a mentalist, like you could understand people way more than, uh, like I thought I understood people that had no clue. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There are definitely good things. You know, I love that. I can really empathize with people. I can, um, you know, I, I feel that, but at the same time, it's very challenging when there are times you get these feelings and you just don't want that heaviness and it's sometimes hard to shake it off. So it's fascinating yeah. though. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And there was this point where, um, I don't know if this happened for you, but, uh, where I'd intentionally try to trigger people because now I could, uh, understand them and I try, and I remember, and I had this, uh, feeling and I've talked to another person that had an NDE very similar to me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he, he said the same thing where you almost feel like it's your duty to trigger people. Cause with triggers, um, it's something, uh, a trigger exposes something that needs to be healed. And I, was, I thought it was like my mission to trigger people to, in order to get them to like view their, their own, uh, wounds so they could heal it. And it took me a little bit and it was, I really regret it now. Cause, uh, you don't want to force people to heal. They have to get there themselves. So it's like that old saying, you can, uh, you can bring a horse to water, but, uh, you can't force it to drink, right? You can only try to drown it, but, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I try not to do that anymore. I just accept people. I'm really trying to accept people for where they are at that time. Um, and know that, uh, wherever their journey is going to take them, that's where it's going to take them. Um, and it's not up to me. And uh, the other thing was I was trying to save people all the time. That's not, that's not up to me either. That savior complex where you're, uh, I think that comes from childhood and stuff where you're constantly trying to save people. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not your job. Uh, and it's, it's up to everybody to move through their own, their own life journey and learn the lessons that they need to learn. Sean, when you first um, were talking about your near-death experience, you were saying that life was very hard at the time. So has your life gotten better? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. I end up getting, uh, so like a lot of NDEs, um, it's a higher instance of, uh, divorce. So I end up getting a divorce. Mm -hmm. Um, we just weren't meant for each other, uh, at this particular time we grew apart, um, terrible communication skills, uh, didn't have any, to be honest. Um, it was not a good environment for the kids. And so we, uh, we end up getting a divorce and separating, uh, and, uh, end up meeting my, my, uh, fiance now. And she's like super awesome. Uh, best part of my life, uh, with as same with the kids. Um, it's a long distance thing. Uh, she lives in Germany right now. Uh, eventually she'll move here. Yeah. So it's a long distance thing. So, um, but, uh, yeah, with it's, uh, my, Finance has gone better. Um, I was able, we were able to move into a nice place with, the, uh, with the girls. Um, I got a new job cause the job I was in, I hated, and I'm in this new job where I teach. So I'm, uh, instructing, uh, crane apprentices, uh, which that's pretty fun. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm able to enjoy life a lot more. So shit still happens, but it doesn't, it doesn't hurt as much. Um, like if something, I wasn't, I was in survival mode so much that anything gets added onto it, breaks the camel's back. Um, but now I have this, I have this space that I can accept that if something, if, if something bad happens or something doesn't go quite my way, it's okay. I know I'm going to get through it because uh, Steve Harvey has this really good quote that says, uh, you have a hundred, a uh, hundred percent success rate of getting through it. And, uh, I really like that because yeah, even though uh, if you feel like you're in this really, really, really shitty time, um, you'll get through it. It, it might feel like you're getting, you're getting 
hit with a hurricane and a fire hose all at the same time, but you'll eventually get through it. And on the other side, um, if you take the time to face your, face your patterns and heal and learn your lessons on the other side is something really, really, really awesome, which is like lots of joy. Um, I, I met my love of my life. Um, the kids are doing awesome. Uh, I'm in a job I like, I'm able to talk to people like you now. Um, cause I'm in this space now where I can, I can do this, where I don't feel like, uh, I don't feel like I'm going to be judged anymore. And if I am, it doesn't matter because, uh, uh, the ones, the ones that count are the ones that is myself. And then also the ones that love me. And, uh, I think that's, that's been, I think the biggest gift for me is not worrying about being judged so much. So Sean, what is the most important thing that you learned from your near death experience? Uh, not to give up. Yeah. Uh, not to give up and that, uh, to be thankful for the mistakes you've made. I'm really thankful for all the, yeah, I'm really thankful for all the tough times I had. I'm really thankful for all the mistakes I made. And I'm really, really, really grateful for the ones that hurt me the most, which is really weird to think about now. That's such a great place to be though. Yeah, I think it's probably only happened in the last week, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, uh, We're evolving. Yeah, and that's the nice thing. Like we keep we keep moving. It's more like this. Mm -hmm. It feels like if we if you're zoomed in, it feels like you're always like this. But if you zoom out enough, and zoom mm -hmm. out enough of your life, and if you could see where you were uh, at eighty, you'd see that it's a track going upwards. It just it's sometimes really freaking hard to see. And I'm not talking material wise. Yeah, I'm talking about uh, your soul and what what really matters, because we're only on this bliss plane for for a blip of time. But there's so many other places and times that we're going to be. And I feel like uh, this is just one one time. And I chose to be here in this particular time because I think it's an exciting time. I think it's going to be there's going to be we're in the most tumultuous uh, tumultuous times of our, I think of of the last hundred years. And I think, um, but with all this darkness around and it, it brings to mind my uh, favorite quote, which is uh, it's always darkest before the dawn. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think right now we're, we're almost, we're almost at the dawn. And Sean, what's nice for the people that are listening right now, if they want to hear more from you, they have a great place to go because you also have a podcast. Yeah. So I decided to start this. I, uh, I had this idea for a podcast, um, about a year ago and I had this, I got this name and I didn't know what I was going to do with it. And it was, it was our collective experiences. So that's my YouTube channel. And where I, this is where I start to explore. I start from my NDE and I'm going to start exploring my entire journey up until, um, up until right now. Uh, and it's, uh, deals a lot, not just with my NDE, but, uh, also being an experiencer because I've had, uh, interactions, uh, with non-human intelligences at four years old. I had, uh, I've come to terms with it now, but I was, uh, taken, um, I don't know where I was taken, but I had this really horrifying experience as a child, uh, that, uh, scared the crap out of me. And, um, I've had some other experiences, uh, since my NDE, uh, there's a lot of, it's kind of interesting that a lot of NDE years, uh, seem to have, uh, UFO experiences after. So mine was before, uh, and then mostly after actually. Um, and there was, uh, there's been lots of interesting things that has happened. So I'm going to, I explore that and then I'm going to make it, uh, it's mostly be a channel, uh, for others who want to share their stories sort of like with your channel. Um, but mine's going to be geared more towards the experiencers. So, uh, experiences of non-human intelligences of the paranormal, uh, anything like that, that want to share their stories. Um, because I think with sharing, uh, like your, your channel is amazing for this, where you just get to share your, your journey. And I think that's what, I think that's, what's important right now. Cause, uh, as we share, we lose the stigma and as we lose the stigma, we, we, we stop fearing being judged. And then with the, when you're not fearing being judged, you can start to heal. And with healing comes a, uh, a much easier life. 
and a better life. And I think there's a big audience that is interested in those experiences. And I'll have the link in the description for any of you that want to go check out Sean's podcast. Hopefully you do. Sean, before we leave, can you give us some parting words? I think know that uh, you're loved. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, even if you don't feel like you are, or if it feels like it's a really tough time right now, um, know that you are loved, uh, not just by others, but uh, I think by the universe. And that if you view our lives kind of like kids on a playground, and that sometimes you're going to trip and fall and scrape your knee or break your arm or something like that, um, you'll eventually, you'll get back up and uh, somebody will be there to hold you and hug you. I think that is such an important message for so many people because they really need to hear that. And I see that all the time in my comments that people say, you know, they just can't feel it and it's important for them to know it's there even when they can't. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, I think for me that, um, (laughs) um, before, yeah, it feels like you're alone. feels like there's nothing around you. Um, I guess right now is that, that you're not. Thank you, Sean. I can't tell you how much I have enjoyed talking to you. It was lots of fun. It's been really fascinating. You kind of took it in directions I didn't expect, and it really was fun to talk to you. It was awesome. Uh, Really grateful to talk to you uh, at any time. It was really fun. Same here, Sean. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Okay, so what did you think? I loved talking with Sean. What I really enjoyed is he's just an ordinary guy, just like so many of us living his life. And then all of a sudden he has this near-death experience. He has these other spiritually transformative experiences and it just totally turns his life around. So I found it fascinating talking to him. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. So please leave your comments, tell me what you thought. And then also, if you made it this far, if you made it through both of these episodes, please go ahead and just type made it in the comments. I really appreciate it when you stick around. So thank you, everybody. I will see you in the next episode. Thanks for joining me on Beyond with Heather Tesh. Please add comments and questions you'd like future guests to answer. Also, if you liked what you heard, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. That'll help keep this podcast going. You can also go to Beyond with Heather Tesh to look for more episodes.